Takashi and Machiko, a newlywed couple, find themselves inexplicably transported to a mysterious bar known as Quindecum. They slowly make their way through the bar and find Dekum, an enigmatic and emotionless bartender, who greets them. After confirming that they have no memory before being here, he tells them that they are required to participate in a game, while clearly withholding any information about their current whereabouts. Naturally, Takashi and Machiko initially try to find a way out but are quickly met with disappointment. Now angry, the man thinks it's a good idea to threaten a bartender that doesn't smile, so the Deccan man calmly moves aside and reveals dozens of bodies hanging behind him. Upon realizing there is no room for negotiating, the couple agrees to play along and they press a red button, which for some reason reminded me of this meme. Likewise, Takashi thought Deccan was memeing when he told them the game they will be playing, i.e. darts, will be a high-stakes game. Each dart thrown will inflict real pain upon the other person, a feat impossible to believe. However, as soon as Takashi throws the first dart, his wife feels pain in her shoulder, but they dismiss it as a coincidence and the game continues with Machiko's turn. She throws the dart and it lands on an organ reflecting Takashi's artery. As the man feels the pain deep in his chest, he realizes everything said about the game is true, yet he still wonders how Dekim made the link work. The pretty boy doesn't say much aside from telling Takashi that although he has to play the game, he's not forced to hit the target. And so the couple agrees to deliberately miss their targets to avoid causing harm. However, as the game progresses, suspicion and tension begin to erode their trust in each other. Thinking this might be their last night together, Machiko tells Takashi that she is pregnant with his child. Genuinely happy, Takashi hugs Machiko, telling her he's glad he's finally gonna be a dad. But after throwing his last dart, he remembers Machiko's friends talking shit in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> this flashback resulted in him, quote unquote, accidentally hitting the pregnant woman's stomach. Dr. Eavesdrop then continued to double down on his douche ass behavior of trying to take his wife's last dart for himself, a thing that Deckham doesn't prevent since the game's only rule is to play for the end regardless of what. As Takashi takes his stance to shoot the last dart, he calls his wife Machi, reminding her of what her friends said. Machiko's eyes widen as she realizes her friends were referring to their other friend named Machi, who also is marrying a doctor. Takasan is taken aback by the thought that he ended his child's whole career before he even began, so he tries to fix things with his wife, but in the process accidentally pokes her with the dart. This time it was truly an accident, but Machiko, fed up with this guy's level of insecurity, takes the dart and emerges as the victor, shattering Takashi's heart in the process, literally and figuratively. Devastated and desperate to alter the outcome, Takashi attempts to reset the game, hoping for a different result. However, Machiko intervenes, recognizing the futility of their situation as she realizes that they are already dead, which Dekim confirms, saying that Quindekim serves as a realm of judgment for the departed. Those who perish simultaneously are summoned to play a game as a means of evaluation for their ticket to either heaven or hell. Confused and disoriented, Takashi implores Dekim, mistaking him for a deity, to intervene and alter his fate. However, Dekum corrects Takashi, saying that he is merely an arbiter. Takashi, looking like the most pathetic man in 2D land, turns on Machiko, accusing her of infidelity. Just to be clear, we don't encourage cheating, but when a dude is licking his fingers and drooling all over himself, it might not be that bad of an idea, if we're being honest. That said, Machiko shows her other wicked face and confesses, telling him that she was only after his wealth, even though her remorse is quite apparent. Consumed by rage, Takashi attempts to harm Machiko, only to be subdued by Dekim, who renders him unconscious. With the game concluded, Dekim escorts the couple back to the elevators, bidding them farewell. At the last second, we can see the chick's elevator going down while the guy goes up. Elsewhere, a black-haired woman wakes up and finds herself in the company of a young girl named Nona. As she inquires about her name, the woman tells her that she cannot remember. Nona assures her that it's alright since she doesn't have a name. Soon after, they take a train ride and an elevator lift to Quindecum, where the emo boy is chilling, he greets Nona and then stands still as the two ladies talk. She explains to her that Quindecum serves as the afterlife destination for the deceased, who participate in games with their lives at stake, and the host's role is that of an arbiter. Arbiters are tasked with judging the deceased based on their memories and display of humanity during the game. Before the dead arrive, their memories are sent to the arbiters, as we see from Deckham's eyes morphing to view them. She then leads the woman to the upper viewing area that is filled with mannequins which, by the way, were the hanging bodies the couple saw earlier. The girls sit down and observe Takashi and Machiko as they play a game of darts, slowly revealing their true faces. Yup, we re-experiencing the events from another perspective and seeing all the ways Takasun fucked up 
as well as the moment Machiko told the truth about having an affair. While the events unfold down there, the lowly explains that hell and heaven don't actually exist, it's what the arbiters say to the guests to keep things simple. In actuality, souls are sent either to the void where they cease to exist or sent to get reincarnated in the human world. Thought we made that clear since when a person hears reincarnation these days, all that comes to mind is slime, harem, and overpowered abilities. Anyways, after the dead depart, the girls meet Deckham in the hallway and Nona commends him. The woman that will finds the entire process dreadful, but Nona assures her that she will become used to it. Curious about the fate of Takashi and Machiko, the woman asks Nona, who speculates that Takashi was sent for reincarnation, while Machiko's soul went to the void. Going over the events that just transpired, the woman believes that Machiko only cheated once and regretted it till the last moment she died, and that the baby was Takashi's despite her claim. Deckham questions Machiko's motives, and the woman theorizes that Machiko lied out of love to spare Takashi's guilt and deceive Deckham into thinking that he was a good person. Further adding, they might have been able to work things out and have a happy ending if they didn't die that day. Deckham, who did not take into consideration other emotions present after the couple finished torturing each other, realizes that the confession bit was an act of love. He then reflects back on their memories and acknowledges his mistake as well as apologizes to his boss promising it won't happen again. Therefore, Nona warns Dean not to ignore emotions and reminds him that everyone makes mistakes. Not gonna lie, after hearing all that, we don't feel bad for calling the man pathetic. True, Machi did sleep with a guy one time, but she not only did regret it, but also sacrificed herself for her man to be reborn again. Hopefully, with fewer insecurities this time. And before you say, no wait, Takashi's son did nothing wrong. We learn from Nona after she departs that Takashi was a very insecure person, he could not trust anybody, and would never be able to live a happy life. Back at Quindekim, Dekim looks forward to working with the woman as his assistant, also, he apologizes once more for his earlier error and confesses his admiration for those who live fulfilling lives, just like Machiko. Moving on to the next guests, a hipster named Shigeru awakens in the Quindekim to find the main man standing by. He invites him to have a seat with the cool kids at the bar. After getting flustered by the cutie there, the enigmatic blue eye hunk introduces himself and outlines the situation with the help of his new assistants. Anyways, Shigeru is only able to recall being on a bus after college, while the girl's memory is completely blank. Deckham notes that they will be able to remember everything by playing a game, which will be determined by roulette. He also emphasizes that their lives are at stake, and they cannot depart until the game concludes. Though skeptical, Shigeru agrees to play the game to help the girl remember her name and who she is. Eventually, the game is decided to be bowling. With a burst of smoke and a golden glow, the bar transforms into a serene bowling alley, and the balls they will be using are special. They hold hearts in them representing the duo's own hearts in shape, size, and beat. Even though taken aback by being able to feel each other's heartbeat, the lads cannot but play, and it's the guy's turn first. Just when you thought Japan no way able to sexualize a thing like human organs, they do it anyways. As they bowl, memories start resurfacing for both of them. Shigeru remembers Chizato, his childhood friend, waving goodbye at him in the sunset, and he wonders if Chizato could be that girl. They continue playing, enjoying themselves, noting this is the best time of their lives. Heh, clueless. In the eighth round, Shigeru suggests that if he wins, the girl will go on a date with him. The girl is a little surprised, but agrees to indulge with him. When it's her turn, the girl remembers working at a bowling alley and recognizes Shigeru as her childhood friend, and excitedly tells him that she's Chizato. In Shigeru's final throw, he remembers a conversation with his friends about a secret related to the girl, a secret so big it phased him badly. You see, it turns out the girl is actually his other childhood friend, Mai Takada, which she too remembers after missing her last shot and losing to the hipster. He goes to congratulate him, but the guy doesn't care, he tells him to sit his bitch ass down, as the man has a date to claim. He confronts the fake Chisato, who was about to tell them that she is the other girl, but then the original bro cuts her to ask for his date whom he won fair and square. Shigeru asks if he can spend a little more time with Mai as he owes her a date, to which Deckham says, Yeah, sure bro, you got five minutes. It's safe to say no one appreciated that joke. Anyway, Shigeru and Mai spend their last moments together hand by hand before their heartfelt goodbye at the elevators of fate. As they leave, Deckham shares with Ahadi that Mai had plastic surgery to resemble Chisato because she was in love with Shigeru since they were kids and Shigeru always liked Chisato more. They both stand and watch silently as both Mai and Chisato are sent for reincarnation. The true happy ending.
something the next guests might not be so lucky to enjoy. As we see Misaki Tachibana, a middle-aged woman, and Yasuke, a younger man, are trapped in everyone's favorite bar, a Quindecim. Yet the pair was not very pleased about being there, especially after hearing that they need to play a game of life and death. That said, Misaki being your typical reality show star believes it's all part of a hidden camera show, but Yasuke is doubtful, so she uses her sex appeal on the Man of Steel to make him play along. Soon after, they return to the bar and push the button of fate, the game they will play is an arcade game with avatars of themselves. Although the man is not happy with his character having no abilities and looking like a wimp, Milf is low-key glad about her character's design and abilities. Her positive outlook soon turns negative when Yasuke quickly wins the first round, frustrating Misaki. Memories of her troubled teenage pregnancy and abusive life quickly start flowing back to her. And by God, what a sad life that was. Before the second round, Misaki convinces Yasuke to lose, promising him a win later since it will look more exciting for the viewers that way. Hence, Yasuke doesn't fight back and tanks all the combos like a total bot noob, but before he gets KO, the menace fights back to make Misaki's win look genuine. Not that he needed to do so as Deckham breaks his joystick using a remote, bringing back memories of his parents' divorce and how he rejected his stepmother. Before the third and final round starts, the chick takes Yasuke back to the bathroom and tells him the plan has changed, he needs to lose the next round so that she can look good. Yasuke, however, being a gamer and a smart man, points out this is not a show, which makes the Japanese Kardashian think. Thereafter, Misaki questions the show's authenticity and Deckham confirms it's not a TV show. Hearing this, Misaki recalls the hanging dolls and expresses her frustration with the unfairness of the game since Yasuke clearly has more experience with video games, but Deckham tells her, is fairness something you've come to expect in your life, while giving her a cold killer look with his one eye. During the final round, Misaki uses her ultimate combo, Loving Children Attack. Yep, it's a shitty name for a shitty combo, only good thing about it was the baby holding a grown-ass man by the neck. Sadly though for the cougar, she couldn't capitalize on the stun since Deckham broke her joystick. As his assistant protests the douche move, Misaki becomes aggressive and stops Yasuke from winning by bashing his head on the screen. Unconscious, Yasuke remembers how his stepmother's only wish was that he accepts her and become enough with each other to close call her mom. She was a lovely lady apparently who treated him well, but due to the depression and the abusive relationship he had with his biological mother when he was little, he later kills himself. Hearing his stepmom cries, Yasuke eventually wakes up and pulls a combo to then end the game in a draw after both players recall their final moment among the living. Deckham confirms to them that they are both dead, and he's there to judge their souls. Misaki attacks Deckham, saying that her life finally turned around and now it has been taken away and demands to be sent back to her kids, but Deckham restrains her. Meanwhile, Yasuke sheds tears regretting the fact he didn't let his stepmom in his life and heart, which in turn broke her heart after he killed himself. Seeing both of them burst into tears regretting their choices, Deckham gives them a hug to console them saying, no matter what, you did the best you could. Not gonna lie, that shit broke me. Sometimes all that one needs is just a hug and knowing. He then leads them back to the elevators. While Yasuke is reincarnated, Misaki is sent to the void, concluding their journey at Quindecim and at the crazy experience we call life. It truly was a heavy dark episode. In contrast, the next trial begins with a vivid dream on the kid's story, which granted in this type of show can be considered dark AF. Luckily, Ella Sistons awakens from this strange recurring dream, takes a path and opens her closet to take her fit. As she does so, Gurley notices an unfamiliar outfit hanging amidst her usual garments. Assuming it was mistakenly placed there, she swiftly changes and heads towards the bar. To her surprise, the new panel that Deckham just put up displays the very image of the girl from her dreams. When she asks him why he is replacing the old one, Deckham tells her that he doesn't know a thing, he's adjusting the roulette at Nona's behest. The chat gets cut short, as soon as the guests, a man and a young boy, enter the room. Deckham wastes no time and queries the do about their memories before arriving at the bar as they take their seat. The man feels a sense of deja vu, telling Deckham that he and the bar seem familiar to him, while the boy has no memory. The whole situation seems to phase Deckham. Meanwhile, Nona is playing a play of pool with an old-timer called Oculus, but don't let the looks deceive you, Dr. Ock is a powerful man. How powerful he is? Well, on top of playing pool with literal planets, the guy is the creator of the system of arbitration, he also observes all floors and is in a higher position than Nona, not to mention he is the second in line to the position of God. Yet he sucks at pool and Nona always beats him. We call this skill issues. Back at the bar, as the man takes a sip of his beer, Memories rush back over to him, recalling every detail about Deckham and the bar. He seizes the young boy, holding him hostage. 
However, the Arbiter swiftly intervenes and restrains the man by using his threads while narrating an old story that the fat guy clearly doesn't seem into it. The man then blacks out, but not because of the boring story. When Deccan looks back, he finds the black-haired woman unexpectedly knocked unconscious. Thus, the man wastes no time and uses his threads to capture the kid. The boy transforms into another Arbiter, Inti. The less flamboyant Hisoka also happens to be an old acquaintance of the main man. Hence why Kinti had no problem confronting Deckham, accusing him of slacking off in his role as an arbiter, and questioning why he hasn't passed judgment on the woman yet. Deckham though explains that he refrained from judging her initially because she already knew she was deceased, so he couldn't prompt her to play the game in turn he asked Nona to erase her memories and ever since that, he was enjoying her company and assistance in handing judgments. Annoyed by his remarks, Kinti attacks Deckham to knock some sense into him. They both lock into a fierce battle, nearly leveling the entire bar to the ground. Luckily, Nona, accompanied by Clavis, the elevator operator, swiftly intervenes, rendering Ginty motionless and preserving the bar from devastation. Nona tells Deckham that the guests were part of a memory test designed for him which he failed to discern. Realizing that he hadn't received any memories of the guests, which was the clue he missed, Deckham apologizes for his failure to follow proper procedure. Clavis removes the lifeless body of the man who's just a mere dummy and departs alongside everyone else. Nona makes a stop at her friend's caster office. Her job is to measure the coefficients of the dead and classify them in various fields to determine their bar destination. We learn from their interaction that humans are dying at a fast rate, faster than usual. Back with the D-man, he gently carries the unconscious black-haired woman back to her room while she continues to experience the same dream about the children's book that Nona is reading, by the way. Now since we got introduced to a new arbiter, it only makes sense that we see the man of the hour doing his thing. The guests are Mayu Arita, an overly energetic schoolgirl, and Harada, an idol singer who happens to be her favorite idol member from his group. Overjoyed by being in his presence, she eagerly shakes his hand. Not wanting to be a part of this cringe sight, Kinti immediately assumes his role as an arbiter and presents them with the roulette button. They spin the roulette, which lands on Twister. G-Man then takes the young lads to another room where the Twister mat is. He explains that they have to place their body parts on the corresponding circles as indicated by the spinner. Mayu was like, say less, as she was thrilled to engage in the game with Harada, who in turn is not enjoying the game since the girl with the heavy makeup is not that cute. He simply wants it to end so he can return to his girlfriend, which makes you wonder why he didn't just fall immediately to leave. Instead, he was show-offing how flexible he is. Meanwhile, the G is chilling reading the memories of the guy in a magazine. As the game progresses, Mayu requests a break, but Kinti ignores her plea and intensifies the game. Each panel now represents various extreme weather conditions. The red is for blazing heat, green is for strong wind, strong enough to send the girl's fake eyelashes flying while blue is for ice cold, and the worst one of them all is yellow. Harada being half frozen uses all his might, abs, and glutes to place his right foot on the yellow circle, causing the remaining panels to collapse, revealing a floor covered in spikes. Ginty informs them that the game will only end when a single player remains, game has turned into Fall Guys. And just as Harada is about to kick Mayu down, she surprises them both by volunteering to sacrifice herself. The fawn girl thanks Harada for comforting her through his music, thanks him for playing the game, and then drops down. However, Harada, haunted by memories of his ex-girlfriend's side following their breakup, grasps her hand and attempts to save her. Despite his efforts, Mayu slips from his grasp and falls to her death. To Mayu's surprise, the spikes turn out to be nothing more than an illusion, and she safely lands on the ground below. Memories flip back to them both. Mayu remembers she died after she slipped in the bathroom, while Harada was killed by his ex-girlfriend's sister, who planned a bomb in his room. A deserved move as it seems he nailed her too. Anyways, when Kinti heads to retrieve her, the girl doesn't seem bothered about the whole she just asks for a change of clothes since her uniform is ruined and returns looking like another person, a cuter one that leaves both Ginty and Harada surprised. Harada seizes the opportunity to flirt with Mayu, leaving her flustered. Proving yet again, once a dog will always be a dog, even if he went kaboom. That said, we back now with the original G as he plays pool by his lonesome and narrates the rules the Arbiters live by. Number one, Arbiters cannot stop handing judgments as it's the purpose of their existence. Number two, Arbiters cannot experience death, otherwise it will taint their judgment making them too close to being humans. Number three, Arbiters can't feel emotions since it's not in their nature. And with that quick rundown, we are back with the black-haired woman, she wakes up from the same dream once again. This time when she gets up and starts to get ready, she notices an odd book on a shelf. She takes it out, and to her surprise, it's a children's book with the same story as the one she dreams about. 
A part of her memories returns and she realizes that she is dead as well making her understandably depressed. Later, she heads to the bar and asks Deckham about the book, but he replies that the book probably belongs to the former arbiter of Quindecim. Years ago, when Deckham and Ginty were created as arbiters and assigned to their respective floors, Nona, their superior, led them to observe Quinn, the previous bartender of Quindecim, as she conducted her final judgment before departing to work in the Information Bureau. Nona told Deckham that he will be entrusted with the responsibility of Quindecim, located on the 15th floor after Quinn leaves. After taking them both to the upper viewing deck, Nona provided them with a remote-like device that could manipulate the games. Throughout the proceedings, Nona noticed that Dee never even considered using the remote, unlike Chi. Upon being questioned afterward, Deckham admitted that he had been distracted, pondering the thoughts of the guests, and had forgotten to utilize the device. Nona realized that Deckham, like the other arbiters, was initially devoid of genuine emotions but possessed the potential, further piquing her interest in his approach to arbitration. What makes one wonder is how a character so cold-looking as well as cold-behaving can have such potential for emotions, unlike the others who seem so vibrant and lively. Anyways, before parting ways, Quinn advised Deckham to find something precious that would aid him, as the repetitive and dull nature of the Arbiter's role could become boring. As the wound inquires about his cherished possession, Deckham reveals his collection of dummies. He explains how he meticulously crafts these mannequins, modeling them after the guests he has judged to ensure their memories are not forgotten. Initially unsettled by Deckham's peculiar interest, the woman's perspective shifts as Deckham explains his motivations. He tells her about his admiration for those who have lived fulfilling lives. Therefore, once the guests are cast into the void and turn into dummies while their essence floats around, he goes down and collects their parts to dress them up and add them to his collection to remember and honor them. Yet he does forget them ironically enough since the memories of the Arbiters are regularly wiped clean to avoid overloading them with information. Meanwhile, Nona and Quinn are catching up having some girl's time. Quinn tells her girl to be cautious about letting the old man know what she's doing with her boy as he doesn't like Arbiters to break the rules they are meant to abide by, i.e., no feeling for them. Speaking about the devil, when Nona wakes up she finds him standing over her. The old G decided to pay her visit since she haven't been seeing him lately. Oculus sends something is up, but Nona tells him she was busy and proceeded to wiggle her way out of integration. Speaking about integration, wait till you see the next guest. Deckham and the assistant prepare to greet two new guests. After their memories start to flood Deckham's mind, he turns to the woman puzzled and tells her that one of the guests is a murderer. He quickly calls Nona to confirm the situation, and she just tells him to handle it while having a devilish smile on her face. The elevators open, revealing a young boy named Shimada and a middle-aged detective named Tatsumi. After they have taken their seat, Deckham goes over the usual point, and just like roaches when you take a piss over their nest, Tatsumi and Shimada attempt to find an escape route, but are quickly met with only dead ends. As Shimada explores the bathroom, he finds a bloody kitchen knife in his bag, causing him to panic. He hastily conceals the knife when Tatsumi enters and asks for his cooperation to get out of this predicament. Both agree to play along in Deckham's game and so the main man presents them with a button to spin the roulette. Tatsumi presses the button, and the game selected is Air Hockey. Despite the fact a table rose from beneath the ground like the undertakes, and the pucks displayed images of the guests' organs, the boys manage to put aside the disturbing visuals and start the game. As the game progresses, their memories gradually begin to resurface. Tatsumi recalls his wife's murder and his pursuit of her killer, while Shimada remembers seeking vengeance for his sister's assault by an unknown assailant. Memories continue to surge back like a river, revealing the actions that led them to Quindecim. And with that, the game becomes more intense since both of them want to get out of Quindecim as soon as possible, not to mention the fact that Deckham abruptly announced that the time limit has expired and the game now switched to a link format, meaning the desks will represent their organs and will inflict pain on their bodies. Before they proceed, Tatsumi inquires about Shimada's urgent matter to which Shimada tells him about his sister's assault and the authorities' failure to assist him. Tatsumi then shares the story of his wife's murder with Shimada. Initially taken aback by Tatsumi's perspective on killing murderers, Shimada eventually agrees, believing criminal scum deserves nothing more than to be buried six feet under. Curious, the black-haired woman requests Deccan to show her the memories that were previously sent to him. He makes a request and the player's memories are transmitted to her. Instantly, her expression changes as she comprehends that both Tatsumi and Shimada are killers. And I will tell you why, it's because they lack those thick thighs. Never forget boys, thick thighs save lives. Shimada and Tatsumi continue to play air hockey as they both vow to seek revenge on those who harmed their loved ones. None of them wants to lose at this point. As they each garner a point, their memories become clearer, 
until Shimada realizes that the knife he found earlier in his bag was the one he used to kill the man who abused his sister. Tatsumin also remembers that he had already avenged his wife and remembers her voice thanking him after he had killed the murderer. Therefore, he urges Shimada to play better so he can get out of this bar and get things right for his sister, also told him about another man who just stood there and watched her get assaulted. Thus, the high-stakes game continues with the last desk representing their brain on the line. Shimada wins the game and the detective gets hit with one more memory revealing his fate crossed with the young lad after hearing the latter full name when Dekum congratulates him on the win. Tatsumi takes a look at the knife and realizes it was the weapon that sent him here. Yet Shimada thinks the whole we are already dead situation is a joke until Tatsubi shows him his wound, refreshing Shim's memory of when he jumped out of the bathroom after killing his sister's assaulter to finish the guy that just entered the apartment. With his mind fucked, Shimada wonders why the detective was in the house that day. Tatsumi reveals he was the one who stood and watched the poor lad's sister get assaulted, telling him that even though he saw the man assaulting his sister, he couldn't help her just so he could gather more evidence on the guy and ultimately kill him. In his mind, Tatsumi perceives himself as an arbiter, he needs to see the bad shit through before quote-unquote past judgment. Hearing how his sister's fate could have been changed if the man acted, Shim couldn't but be enraged. Dekum stops him from attacking the douche, but since he still can't judge them accurately, he asks Shimada if he wants to inflict punishment on Tatsumi. Blinded by rage, he tells him that he wants to kill him. Dekum clarifies, once a person passes away they cannot die, they can still feel pain and so he places Tatsumi's pucks in front of him and restrains Tatsumi, while Shimada grabs the knife to break them. The black-haired woman tries to stop Dekum, saying that he is only drawing out the darkness in Shimada's soul, and that he cannot judge people when he cannot comprehend their emotions, but the Chad doesn't care, he tells her that this needs to happen, so he can observe their actions to pass judgment. However, one needs to point out that her words somewhat reminded Dekum that he has a heart, she also tried to do the same with the young lad, talking him from breaking the desks, so he can be reincarnated and see his sister again in another form. Shimada hesitates for a moment, but Tatsumi manipulates him saying he's weak and needs to fight back. These words break Shimada's mind and he starts breaking the pucks one by one, making Tatsumi shriek with agony before he passes out. After this shit show, Dekum starts to question his abilities as an arbiter. The woman's words struck him deeply, so he decides to visit Nomina and expresses his concerns to her about the flaws in their judgment process. He questions whether the extreme conditions imposed on the guests truly reveal their darkness, or if they instead create it. Despite his doubts, Dekim apologizes to Nona and explains that due to his respect for those who have lived fulfilling lives, he cannot judge them. Meanwhile, the assistant wakes up and finds her skin is peeling and not in a beach skin peel kind of satisfying way, let me say that. Nona informs him to carry out his duties and tells Dekum that the black-haired woman's time is running out and will soon require judgment. Dekum insists that he can't handle judging her without Nona's assistance, yet he is down to do it without the woman's memories as he believes the nature of his assistant isn't that bad. Nona challenges Dekum's belief in knowing the woman's true nature, and asserts that even if he did, he wouldn't comprehend it for he is nothing but a mere doll devoid of emotions, and reminds him about the Arbiter's rules. Frustrated, Dekum clenches his fist in anger, but remains silent. Nona says that a special guest will soon arrive for him to judge, and he must return to his post immediately. Back at Quindekum, he breaks the news to his girl and tells her that humans can reside in this realm for so long, as they will turn back to their original state as dummies. Thus, they head back to the bar to await the arrival of their guest, an old lady named Sachiko. Dekum, like always, explains the details to her and Sachiko instantly agrees to cooperate. She spins the roulette and it lands on Old Maid, a card game. Worth to mention, he doesn't have the memories of the old lady downloaded in his dom. Both the woman and Dekim proceed to play the game with her, during which Sachiko recognizes an old man depicted on one of the cards. She thanks Dekim as some of the illustrations on the cards were made by her, as well as have something relevant to the one playing them, meaning the cards hold memories and events relevant to the person holding them. The game starts, and unlike the other ones, this one doesn't have any kind of organ link bullshit, it's just a peaceful card game. Unlike the ones we have with family and friends. At some point, the black-haired woman picks up the Joker card with ice skates drawn on them, which seems familiar to her. Meanwhile, Nona and Clavis visit Quinn, where the lowly requests all of the woman's memories. Although Quinn protests the idea since the memories need to get condensed, Q ends up handing them in exchange for some booze. Back at Quindecum, Sachiko draws a card and notices that it's an unfinished illustration of hers, making her realize that she is dead. After Dekim conforms it, the game continues normally with a hottie turn, and she draws the character she has been seeing in her dreams. The old lady notices the card on the table. She tells them the character is from a story called Chavit, 
which was done by another famous children's story artist. Suddenly, the black-haired woman's memories rush back as she remembers her mother reading her a story and for the first time recalls her name, Chiyuki, making her cry. With that, the game concludes with Chiyuki losing. Dekim and Chiyuki both lead the woman back to the elevator, destined for reincarnation, and before departing, the lovely old lady tells them that she had quite fun playing the game, thanking them for the good time. Elsewhere, Oculus, the creator of the system of arbitration, having grown suspicious of Nona's behavior, examines some of Clavis' memories and laughs at the lowly's feeble attempts of trying to create an arbiter with human emotions. Back at everyone's favorite bar, Chiyuki notices that her body continues to flake away. Deccan tells her he needs some help to fill some gaps and expresses his desire to learn more about humans before Chiyuki's body begins to deteriorate, necessitating her judgment. Mayu is overjoyed to see Harada again but realizes that he is still unconscious. Kinti tells her that his soul has not returned to his body yet and that in order to bring it back, another soul must be sent to the void in its place, so he shows her a random guide to replace his place in the void. Gi then gives Mayu the red button and instructs her to press it once she has made her decision. Mayu hesitates, wanting to know who the other person is. Kinti questions whether it matters and asks what kind of person she would sacrifice for Harada. However, Mayu being the best guest so far behind the first chick who sacrificed herself for her insecure husband, offers her soul in exchange. Meanwhile, Dekim remembers his first encounter with Chiyuki, who arrived knowing that she was already dead. Dekim couldn't convince her to play any death games and put her to sleep, erasing her memories and postponing her judgment. He had requested to be the one to judge Chiyuki but is unsure why he feels compelled to do so. Shiyuki returns to her room and removes the odd-looking clothes, realizing they are skate-dancing uniforms. She changes into them, returns to the bar, and finds an ice rink waiting for her while Dekim asks her to skate. As she does, her memories come flooding back. She remembers that she became a professional figure skater inspired by her favorite book, Chavit. However, a severe knee injury forced her to retire, leading to severe depression and detachment from others. Despite knowing there were other things in life for her, she found it hard to connect with others, ultimately leading her to kill herself. Suddenly, her doll knee breaks, making her dance come to an abrupt stop. Deckham takes her back to the bar and prepares a drink called Memento Mori for both of them. As soon as she takes a sip, Chiyuki passes out. Deckham contacts Quinn, asking her to send him Chiyuki's memories, not realizing that Nona had already prepared them. Meanwhile, on the 20th floor, Mayu enters the elevator with Harada's body and asks Ginty where it will take her. Kinti assures her that Harada will wake up because she's going to the place where his soul is. The elevator starts to descend, and Mayu notices that her body is slowly starting to flake. She realizes she has been tricked and has been sent to the void as the elevator speeds up. She looks at Harada as he opens his eyes for a fleeting moment before their bodies completely disintegrate. Although it sucks, one could feel alright knowing it was her choice, and that she spent her last moment happy before turning into a doll and joining her essence with his. Also, we see her actions somewhat made an impression on G, so all in all you can say it was a win, I guess. Back with D after receiving her memories, Dekim takes Chiyuki down to the lowest level which is off-limits to the guests. There, he brings Chiyuki back to her world. Upon waking up, Chiyuki notices that she is in her room with Dekim. After getting her bearings, she starts to roam around her house and notices her mother grieving for her in a corner, apologizing for not knowing what she was going through. Chiyuki tries to call out to her. But Deckham tells her that it's no use since the living cannot see them. He hands her a remote, allowing her to be brought back to life in an instant in exchange for someone else's life. As she is about to press the button, she suddenly remembers the people she met in Quindeckham and realizes how all of them cherish someone in their lives and cannot take anyone away from their loved ones. She turns down his offer as she looks at her mom and apologizes to her even though her mother cannot see or hear her. Pain shoots through Deckham's heart as he now finally understands what sorrow means. The world suddenly shatters into a thousand pieces as Dekim falls to the ground apologizing over and over for deceiving her by showing her a fake reality since he only wanted to know what she is really like just to pass his judgment as an arbiter. Both Nona and Oculus, who are secretly watching them from afar, are surprised by the outcome. Oculus still believes that they should judge humans without emotions since they will only get in their way while passing judgment, but Nona thinks otherwise. Dekim takes Chiyuki back to the elevator, assuring her that she will be reincarnated. Before she leaves, Chiyuki tells Dekim to try and smile whenever the guests arrive. Just when the elevator doors close, she notices Dekim giving her an honest smile. 